Hey guys, I'm John Lama and welcome to Family First Life. Today I'm going to spend a few minutes just going over a um, little bit of a quick role play and how I would basically tackle a final expense appointment. So for all intents and purposes, I know this is more of a podcast presentation, but we're just going to kind of play along and pretend that I'm sitting in front of a client and I'm going to basically go step by step and break down each scenario in which I would go through a typical final expense client. All right. So for me, when I'm, you know, sitting with a client, I get in the house. Uh, the first step for me is going to be building rapport. So I'm going to pull up into the driveway or park on the side wherever I'm instructed. And I'm going to take a deep breath, get my belongings, my bag, my iPad, go knock on the door, take a deep breath and step in the door, you know, shake the client's hand. Uh, if it's a you know nicer house, I'm going to ask if I should take my shoes off. If it's, you know, not as nice, I'm definitely going to keep my shoes on. Um, and then I'm going to go straight line, beeline for the table. The client's going to veer off to the left, veer off to the right, and go where they're comfortable. Maybe 8 out of 10, they're going to go straight to the table. But if they ever try to go towards the living room or towards the lazy boys, uh-uh. You know, actually, I need somewhere to write. So why don't we go over and, you know, use this table over here. And I'm just going to go lead the client, take control from the beginning. Uh, along the way, I'm, I'm paying attention. Whether it be the kind of car, vehicle, truck, whatever they have out front, um, pets, dogs, um, horses in the back here in Central Florida, a lot of farms, um, or just general, you know, artwork in the house or interior design. And what you're wanting to do is just create a little bit of, you know, rapport and have a little bit of chit chat with the client so that you can build a little bit of confidence um, and build a little bit of, you know, trust within yourself. And that's literally no more than three to five minutes. So for me, dogs are the easiest. Um, you know, we have a little bit of a conversation and I joke about, oh my God, this dog, blah, 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 blah. And I pull out my phone and, you know, I'll find a, a picture of my dog and, you know, I'll show the client, oh, okay, look. And they're like, oh, wow, so beautiful. Okay, cool. So then uh, right away, the first thing after that for me, you've built a little bit of rapport. Step two, we're definitely going to go right into the why. All right. Now for me, the why is the foundation at which you're really going to solidify your appointment. If there's a kind of a soft or weak foundation, there's really no urgency or necessity for you to continue the appointment. So that's why the why or the reasoning for you being there is super important. So the first thing I'm going to do is turn to the client after a little bit of chit chat and be like, so Bob or Bob and Mary, if it's a husband and wife, I'm going to ask, you know, Hey, who, by the way, who was it that filled out the lead in this case? So you went online or you, you got the postcard in the mail who filled that out? Okay, Mary. Mary, walk me through what was on your mind that day when you filled that out. What, what were you thinking about? And what I'm looking for is that I'm looking for the client to give me some feedback psychologically, not just a transactional response. Well, I want some information. No, no. I want them to dig deep and really f answer me as far as what or who was on their mind when they thought of insurance. Because we want this to be an emotional type exchange, right? Not a transactional type exchange. And um, me asking that specific way instead of, hey, why'd you fill it out is just a totally different reactionary response. So Mary, what was on your mind? What or who were you thinking about at the time? And what we're looking for are just responses along the lines of, you know, oh, well, you know, I had a, a neighbor, uh, she passed recently, and she didn't have any coverage, or she had some coverage, or, oh, you know, well, I'm not getting any older. And not getting any healthier and oh my my sister just passed a couple months ago and she had some coverage and I want to make sure I, you know I was like man I don't have anything so we're looking for some type of response like that if you guys get the oh well you know we just filled it out just because and you know we just want to see what it's all about okay that's cool yeah we can do that don't give up dig some more okay cool yeah so uh, what sparked that like I get it I get it you know okay you want to know more okay what sparked that desire to know more? So you see, you can't just give up and take the answer they give you and just run with it. So I'm going to probe a little bit more and get them to really open up and reveal the reason at which they've had some stranger come all the way to their house to sit at their table. Okay. So think about that for a minute. A stranger is coming over, not just to find out some more, you know, we don't stop there. So depending on how extensive their response is, I'm going to you know, ask things like, okay, well, how long has that kind of been on your mind? Or how long has it kind of bothered you? How long have you been thinking about that? And I've heard everything from, oh, last week when I lost my so-and-so or about a year or two. 
And if they say a year or two, okay, well, it's time to stop procrastinating because you're not getting any younger and you're definitely not getting any healthier. Okay, so I'm here to help that. You know, and we kind of make a joke about it, but it's like enough is enough. And it's true because you guys have to understand the psychology of these clients is that they're professional procrastinators. If they're in their 60s and 70s and have still kind of tried to put this off, our job is to ultimately try to assist them in not procrastinating any longer, not for them, for their families, right? Because they're ultimately doing this for their families. So, you know, I also asked the client, hey, so on top of not only have you been thinking about it for a while, but hey, have you spoken to your family about this? Have you spoken to any other professional about this? Have you had somebody else like me out here? Have you inquired online? Have you been doing some research? And that kind of, uh, again, helps me understand before I go into my presentation a little bit more about if they have the proper expectation, okay? Because some of the toughest clients you'll face will be the client that doesn't have a real expectation on the reality behind what it's like as far as the process to get insurance and qualify, but also premiums and coverages. So, and it's all totally normal. It's totally normal and it's all part of the process, guys. All right, so the client has then answered your questions. You feel really confident as far as the reasoning and the logic as far as why you're there, the necessity, the urgency by why they filled it out. Um, and now you have a solid foundation for you to basically continue. And my favorite way of saying is they've sold me as far as why they need me and how I can help. So then, um, after step one, the rapport, step two, the why now step three, who we are. And that's when then, um, you know, everybody can kind of more or less break down how it is that you want to explain to the client what, what you do. Now, me personally, I have a tragic tale in my previous, you know, last few years that I use as far as my introduction to who I am. And I'll break down to Bob and Mary or just Mary and be like, hey, you know, so let's see if I can help with all that, that they just spent, you know, two, three, five minutes explaining to me about the, uh, the reasoning. And um, before I go any further, Mary, I just want to let you know a little bit more about me, you know, this person that you just met and you've divulged so much and you will continue to tell me a little bit of details as I ask. So I just think it's fair that, you know, a little bit about me and how I came to sit in this chair in front of you today. So at that point, I'll, uh, you know, say, hey, Mary, my name's John, of course, you know, I'm 37 years young. Uh, don't let the salt and pepper beard throw you off. But um, I haven't always done this and I've only been doing this uh, about two years now. And um, professionally, I've always been in hospitality. So I'm sure at one point or another, maybe you waitressed or, you know, bartended or we were a hostess or some type of, you know, hospitality line working in restaurants. That's what I did professionally through a few years in college and then professionally afterwards in my adult life. So as a 37 year old, going back to 2000, 2002 for college, you know, that's well over 15 years. And um, that meant a lot of late nights coming home after midnight, one in the morning, um, I work in Miami Beach in South Florida, moved to Orlando here a few years ago, and I worked at Disney at a steakhouse and missed a lot of holidays over the years, a lot of family gatherings, a lot of birthday parties. And then that, everything changed for me in 2019 when we lost a family member. And it was a wake up call for me personally, because I wanted to basically make a change to spend more time around the family. And we came up with, my wife and I came up with the idea, well, why don't I look into getting into something like this type of field where I can help families directly avoid what I had just experienced with my family? And they think about that. They're like, oh, that makes a lot of sense. And I was like, yeah. So you can't just go out and do this. So I had to get a certification from the state. I passed a test and I'm thinking to myself, man, you know, when I passed the test, I was like, oh my God, I actually have to go through with this. And then they laugh and it just, again, build and it strengthens that bond between you and the client because they understand what it took for you to come to that point where you're there about to walk them through this process of protecting their family. So um, I continue on. I'm like, okay, so here I am. I'm licensed, except this time I didn't make the mistake of working for the same company for the next 15 years like I did in my past. So now I'm what you would call an independent. So as a certified underwriter with the state of Florida Department of Financial Services, now I got to pick and choose all the different appointments I got to take up with the different insurance carriers. So I'm up to about 16 or 17 here in the state. Okay. So basically my job's simple. And at that point I actually uh, pull my iPad out 
And I'm like, look, Miss Mary, uh, you know, my job's super simple as an underwriter. Uh, I basically manage and go over these medical requirements and guidelines these different companies are going to have. And I hold up the underwriting grid sheet and I'll show it to her. I'm like, because, you know, all these do the same thing, but there's different manners and guidelines at which you can qualify. And that's what we're going to do today. Um, so it's not all one shoe fits all. Um, there's a lot of different requirements that have to be met based on an individual individual's age, um, health criteria, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going to run through a little bit of that, your health history, what kind of medications, and then we're going to kind of see what kind of options are with all these different individual companies. And if any of those may put your family in the better position, should anything happen, that's what we're looking for. And then we're going to look and see what makes sense and what doesn't and which one is most comfortable for you. And if we can find something, we're going to see if you can then get it, which is the hardest part. Does all that make sense? Wait for the nod. All right. Should I continue? And they're going to say, sure, of course. Okay. So we got our first little kind of like trial close right there to test the client and see where you stand as far as first, they've understood what you're about to embark on. And number two, they've given you permission to kind of continue. And for me, that's a sense of giving them a, a little sense of control. But in reality, I'm controlling everything. You never want to forfeit control to the client. So then at that point, it's like, okay, game on. And I'm going to go ahead and pull out my worksheet. And you guys can print these out from the playbook or ask your manager. All right. So hopefully that's coming in on the camera. I think it is pretty good. So we're going to fill this out pretty simply here. Everything from uh, just the client's name, uh, whether they're employed part-time or retired, you know, your average client's going to be 50, 60, 70, some on disabilities, mostly retired, maybe a few working part-time, which is fine. Um, tobacco, non-tobacco. Uh, Mary, you're about what? Okay, 67. Okay. And then I go right into the health questions. That's it. So it tells you right there, guys. So heart attack, stroke, TIA, you know, heart surgeries, pacemakers, anything like that. Most of the time, no. Every now and again, heart attack 10 years ago. Cool. Uh, cancer, ever. Not, hey, do you have cancer? No, of course not. Okay, have you ever had? So it's not just the question, but it's the manner in which you ask it. Have you ever had a heart attack? Stroke, TIA. What's a TIA? Mini stroke. Have you ever had cancer? No. Okay. Are you a diabetic? Did you ever get treated as a diabetic? Okay. Uh, do you take pain management pills, pain medications, back surgeries? car accident many years ago. I have, to, you know, fentanyl patches, whatever. High blood pressure. Okay. No. Is it because you're controlled? So you take medication? No. Okay. Uh, cholesterol. That's not really a big one, but again, you just want to make sure and ask a few medications. Uh, lung issues, asthma, COPD. Do you take inhalers? Do you have to take uh, oxygen, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And I definitely harp on this because final expense insurances do not like any inhalers with the exception, obviously, going standard with Aetna, uh, Transamer. There's options, and that's advanced stuff. But my point is, is that you want to probe on these things. Okay, no asthma, no COPD. Hey, do you get, like, you know, uh, heavy breathing under exercise? You know, like when you go walking in a winter morning, do you, you know, get shortness of breath? Does the doctor give you an inhaler even though you don't have – uh, COPD or asthma or anything like that. Or maybe you had pneumonia or, you know, bronchitis a few years ago. Did they ever give you any inhalers? No. Okay. If yes, okay, we're going to write that down. Because when they run these MIB checks and the pharmaceutical checks, they're going to see that stuff, even though the client is not taking something today or yesterday or last year, if it was on there three, four or five years ago, it's going to be on the report. And we need to know about that. So we can't just take their word for it for, no, I don't have anything right now. Okay, what medications have you taken in the past? So remember that, guys. It's very important. All right, uh, we move on. Uh, thyroid, not a big deal. Anxiety and depression can be a big deal. That's your bipolars, your schizophrenias. Okay, um, so none of that. Okay, Alzheimer's, dementia, any memory issues that you can remember? <laughs> and then they laugh, you know. I tell them, uh, you know, my wife says I have CRS all the time. And if you guys don't know what CRS is, Google it. You know, and I can't say that on the microphone. Um, and then I say, no, you know, that's selective hearing. And then they laugh. And again, we're just building a rapport. Okay. Cause in the end, the client is a human being and they want to know they're dealing with a human being and not some robotic salesman. So I'm very personable with my client and you know, they, they laugh and we have a good time and we protect the families. Um, not on the worksheet are some additional questions that I've 
become accustomed to asking because I know they're going to be on applications. And I just kind of advise you new agents to at least look through a few applications. You should definitely be running through some Merico uh, demo applications, some Aetna demo applications, and just generally get a feel for some of the stuff that you're going to ask about. So not on the worksheet here are going to be questions like um, AIDS, HIV, um, Parkinson's, MS, uh, liver or kidney issues like cirrhosis, hepatitis, uh, lupus is another one. Um, AFib, all right, AFib should be one you ask about. That's a big one. And then pacemaker, which if you don't ask, sometimes people just randomly forget they have a device implanted in their chest. So once the clients divulge most of that and, you know, you've asked about what types of medications they've kind of, you know, basically, uh, again, you're not going to know everything. That's normal. Um, then we can kind of start going into more of a financial background because I want to know Miss Mary is probably on Social Security. And in order for me to work on some options, I want to make sure it's in her budget or else we can really be susceptible to getting the excuse, I need to look at my budget. Well, that's why we're going to do it next. And at that point, I personally flip the sheet over, so the blank side, and on the top left, I basically write down the monthly income for either the couple or the client. Um, the majority, 98% of the time, it's just social security, maybe a couple pensions, and you just jot that down and you put a line and you can total it, that's fine. And then everybody has bills. We all have mortgages or rent, majority. Most of us have car payments, which means car insurance. We all have cell phones. Everybody has a power bill, a grocery bill, et cetera, you know, all that stuff. Clients have the same thing. And what we're doing is that we're basically itemizing all that on the back of the worksheet here, one by one, so that at the end, we have what's called a bottom line. Simple. So on our bottom line, it'll basically allow us to find our premiums. Because if the client has a disposable, you know, say $1,200 to $1,500 a month, or even less, like six, $700, then we know that the excuse of I can't afford it is not there. Because guys, ultimately the reality is, is that I can't afford it and the client doesn't want to afford it are two totally different things. And we have to try and kind of gently separate those. Okay. So um, we have a bottom line. Let's just use easy math about a thousand bucks. And, you know, there's some agents that they'll say, okay, Miss Mary. So we got, you know, 10% of this a hundred out of a thousand, we're going to allocate towards some type of coverage. That doesn't mean we're going to use all the 10%, but we're going to use 10% and under. So whatever options come in under that, you can choose from there. Perfect. Me, I just personally used a round number and, you know, let the client choose for themselves. What kind of, what kind of numbers make sense to them? Um, Okay. So obviously we're going to run Americo first, all right? Americo is number one, especially as a new agent. There's nothing that can beat instant decision. And by the way, you're running a business and as a new agent starting a business, you need that cash injection. So Americo is going to approve your client right away or decline so you know. And then if you get approved, the money's in your account pretty quickly, which again, fuels your business. So two important keynotes there. Americo is always number one. The 8% bonus doesn't hurt in six months either. So, <laughs> all right. Um, it's at this point, I'm going to start to, again, elaborate a little bit more on the coverages for final expense to Miss Mary or Mr. Bob and Miss Mary. So that, again, they're included in a little bit of the process. I know that I have plenty of information I need for their health. I have all the information I need on their budget. Now it's just about, you know, making sure that we're all on the same page as far as how these final expense plans are going to work. Cause it's easy for us to know as the agent, right? Agents understand all that, but we forget the client. We can't expect them to just know that's what we're here for. So I'll spend a few minutes and go over that stuff and I'll talk to Miss Mary and I'll say, Miss Mary, you know, you, you've done this before or you haven't. Okay. Cause I, I forget you, you told me that you had talked to a few people on the phone. Okay. So you know about like the two year thing and you know, how some coverages go into effect right away and some of them don't. Okay. I just want to spend a few minutes and touch on that because not all of these work the same. There's always a $20 plan. That doesn't mean it's the right plan for you. So let me just spend a few minutes here. So we have a few different types of insurance. We have, you know, accidental insurance, uh, term insurance, universal, whole life insurance. Okay. Accidental insurance is obviously in case you go in an accident. So that's not for us. We're here to talk about final expenses, which means permanent whenever that day should come. So accidentals off the table, term insurance, definitely not. That puts you on a 10, 15, 20 year plan. What if you outlive it? It's not the ideal plan for us. That's off the table. So then we got universal insurance. Um, again, 
it's not an ideal plan for final expenses, uh, cash values, flexible premiums, again, advanced type stuff for new agents. We'll leave that for another day. We're going to table that. Whole life insurance is really what we're after here. That's your typical final expense policy. Just your traditional whole life. It's a guaranteed permanent death benefit. It's designed for seniors over 50 with, you know, affordable premiums that maybe they're in some pre-existing health conditions. And this type of insurance does accommodate for certain pre-existing conditions. It's not if you've ever had, ever had XYZ, but more, you know, hey, it's okay. When did it happen? And what kind of treatment are you on? If that makes sense. Okay. And then you said you're familiar about the two-year thing. Um, and basically what that is, is that it's a guaranteed coverage. The insurance carrier of X, Y, or Z is going to uh, take on all of that risk on your behalf. And by them doing so, you're going to have an elevated premium because they take on all your risk. And also without going into health qualifications, that's what's called tier two of insurance. And when they take all your risk and guarantee coverage, you have a, a period of 24 months where you have to outlive in order to achieve your full coverage of insurance, that 10, 15, 20,000, whatever. Um, if there were to be a death of a natural cause within that two year period, basically if you're paying hundred dollars a month and let's just say you, you know, pass untimely at 15 months, well, guess what? Your family's not getting that 15,000. They're getting 1500 cause that's the premiums you paid in with an additional percentage on top. And then they go, Oh wow. Oh my God. Yeah. Okay. That's what I'm here for. And that's why we went through all these health questions, because I'm going to try to qualify you for tier one, a final expense, which means as we go through the health assessments and we've qualified through these different underwriting processes, these carriers have, you'll essentially be qualified for coverage from the first day. You're at a preferred risk, a lower risk. You've been accepted at a preferred tier. Uh, so you have lower risk, which brings lower cost. Okay. So you see that you have higher risk. Tier two, higher risk, higher cost. Preferred tier, tier one, lower risk, lower cost. So um, that's that's my way of explaining that scenario to the client anyways. Um, and then they understand. I'm like, okay, does that make sense as far as the purpose of me going through those health questions now that I explain it like that? And of course, they're going to say yes. Now, guys, if that's too confusing, just understand that you have day one coverage and graded two-year coverages. Very simple. And the client needs to understand that not all coverages cover from the first day. Some of them will qualify them for covering themselves immediately. Some of them, they have to have it for two years in order for them to be fully covered. And it brings higher risk, which means higher costs. So there's a reason we're trying to go through this underwriting and qualification. All right. So does that all make sense? Yes. Okay. Should I proceed? Yes. Okay, perfect. So we know you're generally healthy, Miss Mary. Um, obviously we know that this is for, you know, your concerns over making sure Timmy and Tommy have whatever benefit to put you in the ground or cremation, whatever. Okay. So generally right next to, remember we itemized the invent the financial inventory over here, the income, the expenses, the bottom line of, you know, a thousand dollars, $1,200, whatever. I like to draw a line here and then I'm going to draw up some options, a big one, a big two and a big three. And I'm going to pull out my phone for Americo. And I'm going to start quoting some options for Americo. Um, you know, option one is going to be the max at 30,000. Hey, this is what you might be able to qualify for. That's the max that they offer. I just want to let you know. Okay. And then, you know, they just needed a little bit less to take care of the funeral, maybe about 15,000. And then I'm going to maybe put another one here, which is about 20,000. Now you guys can do your options however I want. We always, you know, try to do the maximum or the high and then a middle and then a low. But make sure you know your worth and don't be putting premiums for, you know, $20, $30, and $40 because that's not helping you either. And, you know, I've never had a family complain that we left them too much money on their insurance. So, you know, just do yourself that favor and the client's family, of course. Now, I'm going to write down the numbers of the benefit really, really big across the thirds of that page. And then really, really little, I'm going to put a small monthly premium because you want that big coverage for only that little bit of monthly premium. It's psychological, right? So um, that's what works for me anyways. Uh, I'm not going to give it to them just yet. I'm going to still kind of hide those and put my arm on it so I don't reveal my hand. It's like poker, right? I'm not a sales expert. I came from hospitality. I was a, I was a server. I was a waiter, whatever you want to call it. 
I'm not an insurance expert. I'm not a sales expert. I'm a wine and I'm a food and wine expert. (laughs) Okay. And one thing I learned quickly, it's like poker. The second you reveal your hand, it's game up. So I'm going to try and hold on to that until I'm 100% convinced that they're ready. (laughs) So Mary, okay. I have a few options here. All right. Now these are all for tier one with what I think is one of the top A-rated carriers. Okay. This is like gasoline. And I know this is a silly analogy, but you know, gas stations all have the same gas. Maybe the Wawa is a few cents cheaper than the shell. There's a couple more cents than the racetrack or the seven. You get my point. It's all the same thing. Okay. This is similar, um, except obviously the differences and benefits and riders and stuff like that. This one includes all the riders. That's why I like it. So it includes your accidental. So if you do unfortunately go in an accident, it's going to double your benefit. So that 10 is going to go to 20. That 30 is going to go to 60. And guess what? If you ever take an Uber and a common carrier or like a passenger paying type situation and there's an accident in that case, it's going to triple. That's included too, which is nice. Oh, and that terminal condition, stage four cancer, um, anything where like you have a life expectancy that's changed, you'll be able to take out up to 50% of the benefit if you needed to. So that's all included. That's why I recommend this one. Okay. Now I have a few choices here. They're all well within your budget. This is the easy part. Mind you, Mary, the hard part is, Hey, we're going to run your MIB. We need to apply. And that's the hard part. If ultimately, like, and I know you're healthy, but ultimately you never know. You'll be surprised what I've run into over the last two years with people that are quote unquote healthy. It's not up to you or me. It's up to the insurance company that has to say yes. Right. Okay. So, um, this is the easy part. I don't want to put too much stress. Just kind of pick the benefit that suits your needs for your family. And the one that's the most affordable for you and, um, and then we'll, we'll kind of go from there and see what happens with the MIB. And then if it gets accepted, obviously just make sure you're comfortable with that one because it will basically cover you. So without further ado, go ahead and just choose one there for me and then we'll uh, run it through and see what happens. All right, here you go. I'm not joking here, guys. So there's a reason I kind of handed uh, the client the piece of paper there. I'm going to immediately come almost turn my back, but I'm definitely kind of just kind of going off into my own corner for like a, just a moment there, whoever speaks first loses. And I know you guys have heard that before. So I'm going to stay out of the client's face. I'm not going to say a peep. If they're quiet for three minutes, I'm not saying a word for three minutes. I'm not staring at them. I'm not kind of like pouncing on them. I'm just going to sit here, play on my phone. If they have a question, whenever they say something, so these, it's all good. Finally. Okay. Now I can talk. Um, or sometimes, Hey, you know, they're going to say these are too expensive. Okay. Why is it too expensive? Because all three options are under your budget, which by the way is right there written down on the sheet. So there's another reason I personally do it that way. Okay. If there's any question to how the benefit works, we went over all that. Remember guys. So I've removed objections as they came along. All right. So, um, let's just say in this case, Mary, you know, finally said, okay, yeah. Okay. Well, I guess if anything, I'm gonna have to go with the, the most affordable one here is 15. I mean, and even that, well, I don't know, let's just pick a number, 65 a month. Yeah, I guess I'll go with that. Okay, are you picking it because it's the most affordable or that's the one that suits your needs? I need to know. You know, just the same, if she were to pick the 30,000, I'm going to be, okay, why did you pick that one? Why do you need 30,000? Because you like the most coverage possible? Because that's also about $110 a month, which we decided 10% of your you know, disposable was 100. So I want to understand how the client logically got to that decision before I continue my process. So I'll say, okay, let's just say they chose one. Cool. This is the easy part. Like I said, the hard part will be seeing if we can actually get it. All right. So they're going to ask for the whole nine. First of all, they're going to need to know who you are, run your MIB, check your pharmaceutical history. That means name, date of birth, place of birth, social security, phone number, address, beneficiaries they're going to ask about. They're going to ask for your banking info because running MIBs, you know, that's pretty serious. So they want to make sure you're serious. So you good with that? And they're either going to say no or yes. Most of the time they're going to say yes. And then I'm going to say, cool. I have your decision here. I'm going to try and see what I can do for you. All right. To get you that tier one, grab me your ID. And then um, you got one of those voided checks. They're going to ask for that in case we screw up one of the numbers, you know, one of these right here. And I have, I don't know if you guys can see that on camera, but yeah, you can. I have a stack of checks here. I always get a hashtag, get a voided check always. And once I show them this, that's almost for me a little more comforting for the client because they see I got like a hundred in here and it's almost like they want to be part of the club because it must be part of the process. So everybody else does it. So it's not a big deal if they do it. 
where if I just say, hey, all right, I need your routing number and account number. Who the heck does that? That's just weird and creepy. And even you would say, no, I'm not giving you that info. But also I'm doing this, removing the objection over banking info before I even waste my time in the application. Because they may be cool with the option, but they may not be cool with the questions you're going to need within the application. So I'm going to get all that, get all that up front. So grab me your ID. Oh, and they're going to, you know, one of those void, one of those little paper checks, write void on it. Cause it's all good when it says void, right? Okay. And, um, I'll get this started up and, and we'll see what we can do. All right. Now, some of you guys, you know, have been told, Hey, let's run you through the computer first. But again, it's going in a little blind with America. We have the luxury of doing that primarily more so because if it gets kicked back when we have to pivot, it's just an easier way to go about doing it. But our client here, Miss Mary, was a little healthier, and we're pretty confident, you know, blood pressure medications or cholesterol medications shouldn't be problematic, and it won't get kicked back. And I already have her ID and her void check, and I can just go on asking about my questions that I've already advised her that I'm going to do. So at that point, it should be pretty, uh, pretty easy from there on out. You just open up your portal, open up the sales connection, and you start punching in her details. You already got the client's license. You already got one of her void checks. And then it's just, hey, let's see what happens. Signing away. And at the end of the day, hopefully it gets approved. And you can say, hey, you got it taken care of here. Uh, they're going to send you a policy here in the next three to four weeks. It's not Amazon Prime. It's not going to come tomorrow. Uh, but your coverage is starting tomorrow. And you don't have to worry about a thing. Because if anything does, I'm going to be able to bring a check to your family. Sound good? Of course. All right, guys. So... That's pretty much it in a nutshell. Um, I hope that was helpful. Um, obviously, I'll be able to elaborate on any of these steps that I do in my home, in-home presentation for final expense, if need be. Um, again, my name is John Lama, and I hope that broke it down simply enough in a quick role play of what it's like to go through a final expense appointment. All right, guys.